Okay, so now life has had a chance to get accustomed to land. What's next? I'll tell you what. We find out why antennomophobia is fully justified and that the egg did actually come before the chicken. Three hundred and fifty eight point nine million years ago, the Devonian came to a close, with marine life picking itself up from the extinction event that rocked them. And so the Carboniferous began. Now this was a period in Earth's history that was first described by two willies. No, really. William Conabair and William Phillips first officially coined the term back in 1822, dividing it into four units but these days it's normally broken down into the two sub-periods of the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. And as for the name, well, it wasn't actually for the high amounts of carbon in the atmosphere. It's quite the opposite, actually. Carboniferous actually translates to coal bearing because the high amounts of coal or compressed fossilized plant material, but we'll get into why this is soon enough. First, let's do our usual and see what Earth looked like at this time. As stated during the Devonian, global sea levels saw a major drop, but this actually UNO reversed itself pretty quickly. And in the early Carboniferous, inland seas covered much of the supercontinents of Gondwana and La Russia. Despite the southern ice cap, which was possibly a hangover from the Devonian, much of the land on Earth at this time was covered in tropical forests at the drier points and lush swamps in others. Now it was these lush swamps that gave the Carboniferous its namesake, compressing later on and fossilising into coal. Now the Carboniferous actually saw a lot of changes in terms of geography. As sea levels dropped in the mid-Carboniferous, again, the two major supercontinents and smaller land masses began to push together making this point one of the big ones in terms of building the many mountains that we see today. With the Hercynian mountain belts and Appalachian mountains forming when Gondwana collided with the European side of La Russia. The boundary in Russia between Europe and Asia, which is the Ural Mountains, also began forming at this point, as the Eurasian plate also began its journey on snuggling up with La Russia. Come the late Carboniferous, the land masses had formed a brand new giant supercontinent, one that is arguably the most famous, Pangaea. As well as this, two major oceans formed. The Paleotithes Ocean, which was inland, and the Panthalassa Ocean on the outside. The temperature was another thing that was constantly changing throughout the Carboniferous. At the start, global temperatures were around 20 degrees Celsius, or 68 Fahrenheit, but dropped to nearly half during the middle of the Carboniferous. So much so that ice caps formed once again on the South Pole, foreshadowing the Carbopermian glaciation. Speaking of atmospheric changes, it had a profound effect on life. Marine life wasn't doing so great at this time, since they were trying to recover from the Devonian extinction, made even more difficult by the constantly changing oceans already mentioned. In fact, this poor bunch went through another minor extinction during the Carboniferous. Meanwhile, on land, things were great. As mentioned before, the Carboniferous was named for the abundance of coal. So, obviously plants were doing really well. The horsetails, mosses and trees continued to diversify. And we also see here the very first cycads and conifers. The swampier conditions of the Carboniferous also meant that freshwater life was doing really well, especially arthropods. Various freshwater eurypterids were thriving, including Megarachne, which was originally thought to be a giant land spider. Ugh. Speaking of land arthropods, it was arguably these guys that made the Carboniferous period a lot more famous to the general public. Some of you might remember that I mentioned oxygen playing a role in gigantism, which you can find here. And no period showcases this more than the Carboniferous. It took a while to get started, but come the latter part of the period, arthropods had taken full advantage of the wetter conditions and higher oxygen content, 
which was around a third higher than today, thanks to the rapid diversification of land plants. This meant that less energy needed to be put into their air duct respiratory system and more into growing big. This resulted in a huge diversification of land invertebrates, leading to the Carboniferous being nicknamed the Age of the Insects. Even though insects doesn't encompass most of the things that got bit anyway. And the biggest of these? Well, you had Meganeura, a griffin flyer roughly the size of a hawk, Pulmonoscorpius, a scorpion that was tall enough to sting your knees, and Arthropleura, a millipede who at eight feet long is the largest known land invertebrate in Earth's history. Video on that guy dropping next. But now let's take a look at something a bit more bony. If you remember from the Devonian, we last left the vertebrates having just crawled onto land, developing the first amphibians. In fact, the Carboniferous could arguably be called the Age of the Amphibians, since this is actually where they hit their peak, likely because they were thriving in these wet, swampy conditions. But once these conditions reduced, they just never bounced back the same. But there is a big question mark over how tetrapods went from this in the Devonian to these amphibians dominating many of the terrestrial niches in the Carboniferous. Namely, we don't actually find any tetrapod fossils from the end of the Devonian all the way through to the first third of the Carboniferous. This gap in the fossil record was first noticed by Alfred Romer and so has become known as Romer's Gap. And for the past 68 years, debates have raged on over whether this is down to preservational bias or the tetrapods actually being in a spot of bother. I'll leave it at that for now, but if you do want to see a full in-depth video on this, be sure to let me know down below. Either way, tetrapods popped back in out of nowhere and not only diversified heavily with regards to amphibians, but also tried out a new innovation that would come in handy during an impending extinction event. You see, as great as these amphibians were, they still had two drawbacks that kept them close to water. Being unable to retain water in their eggs and being unable to retain water long-term in their bodies. So a group got bored of swimming altogether and evolved features that circumnavigated both issues. Popping a hard shell around their eggs to contain the amniotic fluid and developing thicker, waxy, keratinous scales on the skin to retain moisture in themselves. This new group that no longer needed to live near water and could go out exploring are known as amniotes. We now had the very first reptiles. Now these adaptations that the new kids on the block had made came just in the nick of time. 305 million years ago, the Carboniferous saw a minor extinction event known as the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. This was a time when the vast coal forests saw a sudden drop off in most of the equatorial regions of Earth, with the comeback meaning that flora was vastly changed. This event fragmented these forests to the point where they formed small islands amongst the large meandering and braided rivers, with many of these islands supporting their own unique ecosystems. Overall, however, the land became cooler and drier, with the cause being hypothesised as either climate change from a short, intense ice age or volcanism. Either way, these dry landscapes spelled trouble for the more water-dependent amphibians, and their numbers dropped drastically. These new amniotes, however, dealt with it just fine, thriving by filling in the empty niches left by the amphibians. Now amniotes can be separated into two groups, one being the seropsids and the other being the synapsids. And it was both these groups that started to diversify during the Carboniferous. Now this distinction is important because both of these groups are actually still alive to this day, but one of them are no longer considered reptiles. Seropsids started out as small lizard-like amniotes, but soon became extraordinarily diverse as shown if we peek a little further in time, as they make up all animals that we think of when we think of reptiles, including squamates, marine reptiles, 
crocodilians, pterosaurs, dinosaurs, the list goes on. So, spoiler alert, they did well for themselves. Now, the sauropsids at this time could be defined by the number of holes behind the orbit. These are known as temporal fenestra, and anything within the clade of sauropsid has either two or no temporal fenestra, whereas synapsids have just one. Also, thanks to them secreting a uraic acid during waste disposal that doesn't need to be dissolved in water, unlike synapsids, sauropsids don't pee. Hence why reptiles do better in drier environments, since they're much better at retaining water. Synapsids, on the other hand, with their single temporal fenestra, started off looking, at least on the surface, indistinguishable from the sauropsids. Soon enough though, they started to look very different by the end of the period. In fact, they dominated enough environments to become synonymous with the next period, the Permian. Now, I won't reveal too much, you'll have to wait for the Permian video for that, but just know that even though synapsids are still around to this day, they aren't even remotely reptile-like. In fact, to see one, you need only look in the mirror. And that's more or less how things finished up. Plants were suffering their first real rough patch since coming onto land in the Ordovician. Arthropods had just gotten the party started before the new kids on the block, known as reptiles, rocked up and started cramping their style, as well as dancing on the graves of many amphibians. And marine life were still trying to sleep off the Devonian hangover, with the exceptions of the Chondrichthys. It was now time for the terrestrial vertebrates to start their takeover, before being forced to deal with the single worst, most devastating event that life on this planet has ever suffered. But that will be covered next time.